These past months, I felt terribly guilty. I've been sitting around here in Berlin while my home country is going through the most politically relevant thing that can happen in a society. I'm looking forward to my trip. I want to talk to people. I want to see what's happening with my own eyes, not filtered through the media. It's always something ambivalent for me to visit Ukraine. I've gone there often, but just twice for political reasons. It feels like going home, but it also feels foreign. I don't really know the country anymore. Meanwhile, Marina Weisband knows another country much better. Germany, her second home. The Weisband family moved here when Marina was seven. They arrived as part of a quota program for Jewish refugees. I like different things about Berlin and about Germany. What I like about Berlin is exactly what I don't like about Germany. Berlin is cosmopolitan. That might sound like a cliché, but in Berlin people don't pay so much attention to rules. You can walk down the street at night and suddenly there's a spontaneous jazz concert right in the middle of the bridge. With people stopping to listen and dance. That's what I like about Berlin. Life is relaxed here. Today, Marina Weisband is a well-known face in German politics. As the former political director of the Pirate Party, she led the party to its biggest victories in Germany to date. And now she's paying a visit to her childhood home. To a country in the midst of one of the greatest upheavals in its history. It's one week before the eruption of violence in Kiev and the subsequent ouster of President Viktor Yanukovych. But as she lands the dramatic events on Independence Square, the Maidan still lie ahead. For now, there is still hope that the protests will lead to a peaceful solution. Marina's Uncle Nikolai and Aunt Olga are waiting for her at the airport. Today is a special day. Their niece has finally returned, a rare but welcome guest from Germany. Ukraine always opens my eyes to the ways in which I feel Ukrainian and feel connected to Ukraine, how I speak, how I party and enjoy myself. These are my roots. Marina's extended family has gathered in her cousin Vladimir's house at the edge of Kiev. The table is covered with all their favorite traditional Russian and Ukrainian dishes. It amazes me that whenever I go back, even if it's years later, my relatives still look the same. They say the same things, and that sense of warmth is there right away. It's as if I'd never left. <laughs> I never have to feel like a foreigner or like I'm an intruder in the family. When I'm in Ukraine, it's home. It's the food I've been used to ever since I was a young girl. It's that feeling that all is right with the world. The family celebrates Marina's arrival long into the night. The next morning, Kiev is quiet, but there's a palpable tension in the air. The protests are in their 13th week. Later, we'll realize that this was the calm before the storm. 
erste Eindruck von der Stadt entstand ja eigentlich, als ich My first impression of the city came when I went for a walk on the Maidan. It was intense. Ich meine, ich war schon viel in Kiew. I spent a lot of time in Kiev and I've seen many protests here, but this was intense. Krass. Ich wusste gar nicht, was mich erwartet. I didn't know what to expect. Would it be a crowd with people screaming at each other? Or an emotionally charged situation? Or a pseudo-military camp? Or what? It's strange to suddenly see smoking, steaming barricades on the elegant Cheshatuk Boulevard, where you'll find Kiev's most expensive shops. It's like ordinary life is suddenly superimposed with scenes out of a movie. Suddenly the world of film is the real world. But it also makes me feel like, yes, because this is justice. The people who shop here don't have much to do with the other Ukraine. The Ukraine where old people collect used bottles for the deposit, where people can't afford tea, where sick people can't afford treatment. It's a social divide that's almost painful. Different parts of society occupy the same physical space, but they have nothing to do with each other. And suddenly, there's this cry, this protest against injustice. What's happening now is good, because Ukrainians are discovering that they have the power, not politicians. Instead of just exchanging one politician for another, they're starting to say, we are the ones who count. It's our voices that need to be heard. Many people here say, God sees that we're standing here in peace. God will find a solution. But I can't yet see a way for this to end peacefully. And today's peace won't last. Five days later, Blood will be spilled here on Independence Square. What do we want to achieve? We want to join the European Union. And we want Ukraine to get rid of those bandits up there who've robbed and plundered the entire country. Not just one or two of us, but all of us. It's not just old people like me who've come here. And there aren't any politicians here. It's also young people and students. The future belongs to them. They want Ukraine to join the EU. Not because the EU has cheap sausage and pricey cars, but because they want to live under the rule of law. I'm convinced God will help us. God is with us here. But what about the protesters who are willing to use violence? I've seen some of them practicing attack maneuvers. Isn't that true? If we have to, we'll defend ourselves. If the authorities want a bloodbath, we have to defend ourselves. But I'll say this, human life is the most important thing on both sides. I don't want to just go into detail with one person. I want to talk to a lot of different people about their opinions. Talking to people is easy here on the Maidan. It's almost automatic. There's a strong sense of solidarity. The woman I spoke to wanted to give me a kiss because she felt we're on the same side, fighting the same battle. That's unusual here in Ukraine, that kind of openness towards strangers. The mood in Kiev City Hall is a very different one. Various opposition groups are still occupying the building. The far right wing of the anti-government opposition is dominant here. There's the Svoboda party and its controversial hero Stepan Bandera, who led a nationalist movement in the western Ukraine. For some, he's a national hero. For others, a Nazi collaborator and a criminal. The Nachtigall flag is a reference to a Ukrainian Nazi battalion during the Second World War. Most of these flags belong to the Svoboda party, which means freedom. The party has a very definite program. 
And most of the demonstrators don't see that as a problem. They say, of course, they're fighting for Ukraine's freedom. It's our country and nationalism is healthy. That's the way it is. But even though some of my friends agree with that, I don't share that opinion. I think there's a danger that they might not be seeing because they don't share a history like Germany's. They might not have learned all that much about history and about how it all got started, the roots of it. I've never experienced any anti-Semitism myself here. And certainly not on the Maidan. And no one has told me about any problems. But I'm still hoping to talk to people in the Jewish community about what they've seen and experienced. But what I've heard is that family, friends, people I know have said casually, well, he's probably a Jew, he's too clever to stand in the first row. So the idea of the clever Jew, that is something I've come across. Kiev on the Dnieper River was once compared to Jerusalem because of its Orthodox Christian monasteries and churches. Today, some 2.8 million people live in Ukraine's largest city. I love Kiev. Kiev is like a familiar friend or lover. That might sound like a cliché, but I feel close to this city, and that's not something I feel so often. More than 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union and Ukraine's independence, Western goods and Western fashion are a common sight on Kiev's streets. But for many, these luxuries are out of reach. Ukraine is one of Europe's poorest countries. The people here are more European in their dress nowadays, but they don't look more European. They have that look of grim determination on their faces. They know their handbag might get stolen. They can't leave any cash at home because that might get stolen too. They can't buy insurance because they think the insurance will take their money but never pay anything out. That look of tension and wariness is very typical of Kiev, I think. People in Kiev and in Ukraine as a whole don't have an easy life. The mentality goes back to the 1990s that you have to take everything you can get. It's not that people are bad really or different. It was just a way to survive. And I'm always amazed at how Ukrainians manage to keep their sense of humor, even if they're just struggling to keep their head above water. For Marina, the Kiev subway evokes some of the most vivid memories of her life here as a young girl and some of her happiest moments. The biggest difference to the subway in Germany is the smell. It smells like earth, like soil, like the metro. The trains are deep underground. There's kilometers of earth above us. And the stations are works of art, every one of them. It's the city's main form of transportation, but it's also a space of culture and of art. Everybody who lives in Kiev takes the metro. Whatever their income, whatever their destination. That's different here because in Germany there are certain types of people you'll never find on the subway. In a few minutes the platform will be full again. At night the bright neon advertising lends Ukraine's capital a glitzier and more affluent look. But Marina's thoughts are elsewhere. She's going to pay a visit to some political compatriots from Ukraine's Pirate Party. Their president, Sergei Yarygin, organized the meeting. 
Here in the cellar of a Kiev student bar, they talk politics. Sergei heads the Ukrainian pirates. They haven't founded an official party, though, because they don't want to be corrupted. Launching a political party costs a lot of money in Ukraine. If we transplanted Germany's pirate party to Ukraine, we'd fail miserably because of all the corruption. In Germany, the pirates deal with the issues of an affluent nation. We say we need greater transparency in the political system. But here, they don't even have a functioning political system yet. So the pirates here are a cultural force. They try to create open infrastructures and networks. They connect Ukrainian schools with European schools, so the children can learn foreign languages over Skype and exchange ideas and values with Europe. They want to teach children to be responsible for their surroundings and their society. They understand if people can't get organized, if a building association can't even get a new garbage can without calling the president, then they'll never have a democracy. Society is overdue for a change. The people know what they want, but they also need a direction. And we can play a role in giving a direction. The pirates are just a small group, but we can also play our part in organizing people and in taking power away from the state. The powerful and mighty people up there don't do anything. Nothing at all. We have to take power into our own hands until they realize that they are the powerless ones, not us. Night has fallen on the Maidan, the heart of the Ukrainian protest movement, and the home away from home for some of the protesters. The sound of music is coming from one of the tents. Listen, people, I just found one of my songs that I wrote back in 1999, and the lyrics match the current events perfectly. It's about people who are forced to defend themselves. So it's about us. The young singer and his band are singing about freedom and about people who are determined to reach their goals and about men who set aside thoughts of their women as they look to the future and to their struggle. The next morning, Marina pays a visit to another place that reawakens childhood memories, a hospital in the center of the city. The Chernobyl nuclear disaster shook Ukraine and the world in 1986. Marina Weisband was born a year and a half later. My mother told me that my story is fairly typical of what happened to children who were born near Chernobyl. And that's the only reason why I speak about it publicly. I wasn't healthy as a child, very unhealthy. I had problems at a very young age. But that was normal. That happened to many children, including many of my cousins. I had one diagnosis after the other. And eventually the doctor said, what can you do? She's a Chernobyl Ditya, a Chernobyl baby. And they said there was nothing they could do. That's when my mother decided to leave for the West. She figured if anything could help, it would be Western medicine. Not all of these memories are easy for Marina. But what is especially upsetting to her is the state of health care in Ukraine today. There's no proper health insurance. Health care goes to those who can afford it. 
Ich habe viele sowjetische Krankenhäuser von innen gesehen. I was inside many Soviet hospitals and spent a lot of time there. It's not pretty. Back then, and to some extent still today, the rules were that children couldn't have visitors, because the hygiene rules won't allow it. But when it comes to hygiene, they don't see it as a problem that the rooms where the medical instruments are being disinfected are infested with mildew. They have a very crude understanding of what hygiene is about. Soviet hospitals weren't very pleasant, and Ukrainian hospitals still aren't very pleasant. Not all that much has changed in that respect. In the afternoon, Marina sets out to explore the traces of Jewish Kiev. Despite her own Jewish roots, this chapter of her journey is a voyage of discovery for Marina. Even after the Holocaust, Kiev was home to hundreds of thousands of Jews. Today, most have gone elsewhere, to places like Israel, Germany, and the US. Marina has an appointment with the rabbi of a reform synagogue. Today is Friday. Sabbath services will soon be underway. Rabbi Alex Duchovny is pleased to have a visitor from Germany. He shows Marina his new and modern synagogue building and says he wishes that Jews like Marina would return to their home country. I come from a very secular family. It took a long time for me to realize that my family was Jewish. I didn't know it when we lived here in Kiev. And it didn't affect me for most of my life. It wasn't until I was in Germany that I found my way back to it. It was my own wish, not something from my upbringing or tradition. I didn't have that at home. And then the Sabbath service begins. A small handful of people are here to celebrate what remains of Jewish life in today's Kiev. I want to see what I left behind, what might have been a chapter in my life if things had been different. It interests me. It must be a strange situation. Most Jews have left Ukraine. Only very few still live here. The members of this small Jewish congregation in Kiev tell Marina that anti-Semitism still exists in Ukraine. But it's gotten less in recent years, they say. Later that Friday evening, the weekend is approaching. It was to be the last peaceful weekend the city would experience before the escalation on February 18th. Compared to the Kiev of my childhood, it's much more international now. You see faces on the street that aren't just Ukrainian. The culture isn't just Soviet. It's grown more cosmopolitan. And I really hope that'll continue. After an eventful week full of new impressions and old memories, it's finally time to relax. Big Jump Band is performing at a club called Creative Space. The fans are here in force. I see people here who are very open and cheerful. They get up spontaneously and start dancing. They're more open. They're more willing to forget the cares of the day-to-day. -day. 
Ukrainians have a special talent for partying. We have to dance and listen to music at the barricades. We have to make jokes and paint paintings. How else could we survive all of this? On Tuesday, February 18th, the bloodiest chapter in Ukraine's current protest movement began. For days, radical anti-government demonstrators clashed on the streets with the feared special riot police unit, the Berkut. Scores of people were killed in the violence. Marina Weisband had returned to Germany less than a day before. But in her thoughts, she's still back in Kiev. On live stream, on the internet, on television and radio, she follows the events minute by minute. And she's afraid for the people she left behind. At the moment, the question isn't how to create a better democracy. It's a question of survival. I hope things will improve after a new election. But I'm not sure. I think it'll take years before we can build a reasonable, healthy democracy. The Maidan lies in ruins. The future of the country is more uncertain than ever. My fear is that the situation will escalate to the point that radical elements will win a new election. That might even be worse than Yanukovych's government. I hope that won't happen. I hope that people will be too smart for that. It was an eventful and emotional journey home. I was never as happy about visiting Ukraine as I was this time. And even if I'm separated from the events now, even though it's all happening far away, I'm still there somehow. I was there. I understand what they're thinking. I saw how they planned those defense systems and what tactics they were practicing. I know those people. And I looked into their faces. That might be the only aspect that makes this bearable for me at the moment. I'm not a tourist in Ukraine. And right now, I'm not a German politician watching events on live stream. I'm also a part of this movement. 